I had a few good reasons to assume I would hate Suzume. We've seen three of Shinkai's films. Yes, those three. We liked your name quite a bit when we saw it in theaters, but its flaws became apparent on a rewatch a few years later. We did not like Weathering with You, which made its flaws apparent to us rather immediately. Never watched it since watching it the first time, but I don't know, maybe we'll go back to it. Still, thinking about that film had us pissed off for a little while, although we're less pissed off now for reasons we might get to later. So, when we went to watch Suzume, I was reasonably expecting to hate it, or even worse, enjoy it, while seeing some intractable flaw in it that ticked me off immensely about it. And... I found none. I mean, maybe I'll think of one later, but my current opinion of Suzume as I write this hours after having seen it and speak it about a couple days after having written this, is that it was a pretty good film with a lot of breathtaking visuals, funny moments, some emotional bits, and no real huge flaws to speak of. In fact, not only does this film lack the biggest flaws of its predecessors, it's also got the few things about it that I appreciate more. First thing I liked immediately, girl. I mean, her name is the title. It's no secret that we of the joystick system appreciate beautiful anime girls, and this particular such beautiful anime girl is good, both as the protagonist of the film who does all the proactive things to say the guy, which is different from the last two movies where the guy did all that stuff. I'm not gonna pretend like Shinkai is some kind of feminist icon now for correctly giving a female character some goddamn agency, but it's a nice touch for us personally, given that we like like girls. It helps that Suzume is emotional and interesting and funny and has a pretty good arc throughout the movie and her voice actress does a good job. No, we did not watch the dub. I'll probably talk a bit more about her later, but I think she's good. I think it's important to mention with regards to this girl that she was apparently supposed to be gay. This information came to light in the English-speaking anime community after a Japanese entertainment journalist tweeted a tweet saying as much, and then professional translator Mugi went and tweeted about it in turn, citing this journalist as a source. I can't find this chain goes back any further than that, although I tried to out of personal interest, because if I had, then I would have been able to write that into the Wikipedia page, which I did check, and it briefly mentions that- Okay, so since writing that, another Wikipedia admissible source in the English language emerged, in which Shinkai is interviewed and confirms this to be true. So, as such, I added that information to the Wikipedia article with that source. Look, there it is. And it's still there, probably, unless someone removed it while I was making the video. In this interview, the interviewer asks Shinkai directly about this, and he says, I'm surprised you know it. I've only told Japanese interviewers about it. Clearly, Shinkai is unaware of the power of Muki. So he goes on to say that yes, it was his initial idea for a companion, and that the theoretical character who Soda replaced would have been Suzume's Onesan crush. That's how I'm taking this whole sisterhood romance thing. He thought he'd done enough with the boy meets girl thing, and he wanted to try doing something else. His producer rejected it because in Shinkai's Translated words, you may be tired of these romantic stories, but your audience loves it. Which I believe is a polite way of saying, I don't think a gay film will sell. The chair thing was chosen to not make it too much of a romance. Shinkai further says, and this part kind of gets me, that he doesn't think the story would have changed if it had been gay, or if Suzume had been a boy, or non-binary, or whatever. Quote, it's not necessarily the context of male-female, it's about a human overcoming something. In my future films as well, I want to focus on that human story, as opposed to too much commentary on gender or sex. So, my reading of this response, and take this with a grain of salt because it's only my personal interpretation, is that while Shinkai was interested in making a gay film as a change of pace, he did not consider it important enough to insist on. There were other things he wanted to make the movie movie about, and he didn't want to die on the gay hill. And, you know, that that's a shame. But I think it's fair enough. I would have liked to see the alternate timeline where no one stopped him from making the film gay, but if it wasn't already clear, I like the film that we got, and I don't fault Shinkai for having 
other priorities as a director, like for instance, getting his film funded and keeping his job. And honestly, I can halfway see the merit in not making it a gay film, because then it'd be a lot harder to, you know, address the themes without addressing whatever gay discourse there'd be that overshadows the themes. I don't say this to be like, oh, the film would have been just been gay and that would have been bad. No, it would have been good for the film to be gay, I just mean that a lot of the time people are more concerned about there being representation rather than the quality of the story in which the representation exists, and it becomes the gay thing rather than the thing that happens to be gay. And that's not always great. I mean, I guess we are getting a little bit of that just off of the knowledge that the film could have been gay, but at least I don't have to think about talking about it too much past this point because it's, you know, not actually in the film. Shinkai said other stuff too, I guess, about the animation and how the characters have different color palettes for daytime and evening and night scenes, which explains the very convincingly presented amusement park scene that happens at night. So that was interesting. Anyway, that's the addendum I have about that. I'm gonna go back to the rest of this. I have no idea if this would have been good for the film or not, but we have a different video being written about gay pandering, so let's move on then, I guess. The second thing that we liked was the film's opening minutes, and to explain why this is, I need to give a bit of context, I think. So, in short, after the 2011 nuclear meltdown and earthquake that irreversibly forever changed Japan and the life of all the people living there, and also delayed Madoka Magica's finale, Shinkai apparently decided that he wanted to make a bunch of films about it, about three so far, to be exact, which, you know, is not a bad motivation for making films. It's certainly a better motivation than I had to write this video. So, as such, his last three films are a novel fusion of wacky comedy, coming-of-age romantic melodrama, and disaster film. Your Name and Weathering With You had really slow build-ups to the disaster part of the disaster film, to the point that mentioning it is almost a spoiler. But I'm going to assume it isn't, because everyone has now seen those films. So they have a whole first half where it's just kind of weird, supernatural, romantic comedy slice of life hijinks, but then it abruptly tone shifts in the second half. This is actually, I think, the source of both of these films' major issues. It's kind of cool to watch them the first time and then see the story's tone shift when the mid-movie plot twist happens, introducing the big disaster scenario aspect of the story along with it, but the drawback to that approach is that you have, in essence, a movie whose plot twist is that it becomes a different movie. This both contributes to the odd tonal whiplash and also means that the supernatural disaster part of the film is weaker and not as well fleshed out as it could be. Suzume May, on the other hand, smartly introduces the main conflict of the story in the first act of the movie. This choice is good. The serious existential threat to Japan stuff that the film is about is the immediate focus of the film. This allows for a more balanced tone, as then the movie can comfortably use its comedic parts to add levity to its treatment of that harrowing topic, rather than the existential stuff coming in like a sledgehammer to break a previously comfortable tone. Which I should say, is a thing you can do, and is a valid choice to tell a story. I, I just don't think it was necessarily a choice that Shinkai handled well before. The pacing is much improved, as the supernatural aspects of the film are more evenly developed, and the story has more time to explain itself, mostly. There's like one scene I don't get. I'll get to it. Anyway, the end result of this choice is that Suzume feels like a much more focused and complete film, rather than two halves of different films. And I appreciate this. A lot. I can see this choice maybe, maybe, maybe making the movie less interesting to some people because it's paced more like a normal movie than Shinkai's other previous two romantic comedy disaster movies. But hey, I think it's nice that Shinkai seems to be growing as an artist and a writer and a filmmaker who made a normal movie that didn't leave us confused and disoriented and confused about what it's about 
Other things I like. I like the visuals. The animations and backgrounds and visual effects and the CG are all pretty fire. Suzume is generally a really beautiful film. We all knew this, but really, it's it's really good. I like the chair thing. I like the way that the chair is animated. Apparently the animation of the chair was inspired by Luxo Jr., you know, the Pixar short that became the origin of the Pixar lamp. And yeah, I can see it. It definitely does have that old Pixar vibe of an animate object moving like a very real human that that has. I just like the way the legs move, the way it emotes so convincingly with these subtle but credible motions. There's one scene involving a roller coaster that, that scene is incredible. That's definitely one of the most visually novel sequences in all of Shin Kai's films that we have seen. I like the character design of, of, of this guy, Sota. Also, when he's not a chair, I mean, I, I don't know. The last two guy characters in the last last two Shinkai films looked like generic anime boys, but this guy looks like the kind of guy I can believe a woman would find attractive. I like the look of his hair. I like how grizzled he is. I, I like his long gray coat. I like also how, you know, weathered and weary he looks, despite obviously being a pretty young dude. I like that you can look at this tired 20-something hunk of a man and immediately see that he's been places and that he's carrying some some shit with him. Bonus points for that he looks like one of the Monogatari exorcists. As for Suzume, well, her design is maybe a bit generic, but she's a girl. It's not like our standards are too high for girls. She's supposed to be an ordinary girl. And, you know, in this movie contrasting with this dude and then this chair, that works out well. And also, I appreciate that she rotates her outfits throughout the movie. My headmates and I love to see a woman change her clothes, not necessarily directly. I'm just saying, that denim jacket thing she had going on in Kobe, and then when she lost her shoes in Tokyo, and then borrowed Soda's boots, specifically borrowing the boots, because the only pair of shoes that we own looks like this. It's a small thing, but like, Shinkai couldn't make Suzume gay. Widespread trans representation in anime is a bit far off. I might well be eating off the floor, conjuring table scraps, pointing at a woman in a man's shoes, and saying, Oi, isn't it gender? But like, one, it's a woman wearing a man's shoes, and two, yes, it is gender, and we like the gender. You cannot stop us. We did get to see the movie a second time with a friend. Thank you for seeing the movie with us and reviewing our script. And she insisted that the boots are femme-coded, and we disagree, unfortunately. I'm sorry. We cannot see these boots as anything but gender. However, it is Shinkai's fault that Onimai exists. That scene in Onimai is definitely influenced by that scene in Your Name. We know this because Neko Tofu said so in interviews. Onimai is very good and based and funny, and this is a fact upon which I and all of my headmates equally quite agree. It's nice to agree on something with all of yourself. Speaking of the opening scene in your name, Shinkai did not sexualize Suzume. So, if you hated that scene of your name, there's none of that. There's no chair peeping on Suzume or anything like that. So, if that knowledge helps you somehow, now you know. Long story short, should you watch Suzume? Well, Yes, obviously. By the time this video comes out, or by the time you're seeing it, its theatrical run might well be over, but like, if it's not, then yes, I recommend going and seeing it, like, today. And if it is, then remember to see it whenever it's on Blu-ray or streaming services or your local cat-themed anime distributor. Jinkai made a normal movie. I hope he makes an abnormally good movie next time. I believe in this man, again, somewhat. It's not like it really matters what I say or think, but I do also hope that his next movie is just gay. It won't matter to, to me or to us if his next movie is just a carbon copy of Suzume, but gay. I mean, he got away with making a heterosexual your name once after making the heterosexual your name. There, there is nothing stopping him, except for the pig-headed businessmen who he may have to argue with. Anyway, that's that. I'm done with the spoiler-free talk. I guess I'm going to talk more specifically about the plot now, so if you didn't see the movie, then leave now if you care. If you did see the movie or do not plan to see the movie, then uh, don't leave, please. I'm going to put Patreon credits here. It is, it is not the end of the video. Please do not leave. Hello everyone, this is Audrey of the Joystick System, the name of the brain that I'm the 
lead woman of. We're still a plural system, as I've not forgotten, thanks to Lucy and all my hitmates. As I already said, we saw Suzume a second time with a friend. As of this speaking, it continues to play in movie theaters, at least where we are, although it's not showing nearly as often and probably not in as many places. Nonetheless, if it's still playing in your area, I obviously very much recommend it, if you have the time and money to see it a second time after seeing the first time. I think you should see it a second time, because it's good. One thing I'd really like to change about this video overall is the tone of it. I think it came off way too much as, oh yeah, Suzume is actually pretty good, because I walked in with muted expectations and then walked out feeling like it was pretty good, but also kind of waiting for it to hit me that it's actually bad, and no, no. It's an absolutely fantastic film, and I imagine is probably going to line up with our top five movies of the year. Although it's not like we watch a lot of movies, so it probably won't have too stiff of a competition. A different friend of ours saw it, and they absolutely loved it and had a lot of really good things to say about it, and that just made us like it more! So yeah, no, Suzume is fantastic. Please watch Suzume, if you can. I think I also should say, I disagree pretty strongly with the assertion that Suzume is the same film as Your Name and Weathering With You. As I've already said, the structure is much more cohesive in how it introduces the plot without the plot becoming the plot twist of the plot, and also there's just generally a lot of improvements on writing and characterization and storytelling, and the film is generally much more tonally consistent than either Your Name or Weathering With You. Sure, it's a similar overall plot to both of those films, but I think there's just as much merit in iterating on old ideas as there is in introducing new ones. And and Suzume does a healthy amount of both. Maybe it's a remake of the same movie, but if that's so, Suzume is definitely the best version of that movie, in my opinion. And I think the growth Shinkai went through as a director and a writer to get there is crystal clear. And, as I hope I'm about to make clear, the thematic weight of the film is much stronger as well. The decreased focus on the romance subplot helped a whole lot in that regard, I think, to bring the themes into greater focus, and gosh, is the film really thematic? good on top of being so well structured and written and visually spectacular. I walked into Suzume expecting it to be bad, I spent like two weeks while writing the script and making the video trying to think of flaws in this movie, and I can really only think of like two, which are one, that it's not gay, and two, that some minor plot details are maybe a small bit inscrutable. But neither of those things actively bring the film down, it's just great. and. If we had the time to watch the film a third time and do a complete rewrite of the script, I'd probably change the tone I took with it, but you know what? Gotta say a thing, I've left people waiting long enough, this movie won't be in theaters forever, so it's good enough, good enough is perfectly good enough. Also, the music was really good. It was a lot less intrusive than in Your Name and Weathering With You. Those two films really love going all ham on their mid-movie insert song sequences. In Suzume, the music is the musical score, which is really, really good and is used really extremely effectively in specifically the chair chase scene, and the amusement park scene, and the opening of the film, and the big Tokyo scene, and really the whole film. It was just really very good. And other than that, I think I mentioned everything I wanted to mention in the script, so uh, yeah, that's that. So before we get back to the video, channel housekeeping, I don't think we're going to be able to keep doing videos, at least not regularly, as things are going. If you're not already aware of the disaster life we lead, we've been aimlessly floating around, quasi-homeless and unemployed for about our entire adult life, and spent about three years crashing at a friend's place for longer than we should have been because of executive dysfunction, burnout, and general mental illness, and also money. Most of the stuff we've been making our videos with, including our desktop PC, was stuff we got before we were quasi-disowned by our parents almost uh, six years ago, and the rest of it is stuff we have very not hyperbolically emptied our bank account because we kind of needed it. So, if that stuff breaks, and it's going to eventually, we'll be on even more hiatus until further notice. 
Obviously, this is pretty untenable, so we're going to have to try to get a job, and I don't see great odds of that working out for our transgender, neurodivergent, fail woman child self, and it's obviously going to mean we have less time to make videos and write things. Naturally, the stress of this unstable situation has all already been doing that job, but you know. So, if you want to help even our odds, uh, Ko-fi or Patreon. That is currently our only source of income, and even a little bit extra would make a pretty big difference for us day to day. You can send us monthly donations through either, although they take a smaller cut on Ko-fi, so there's that. Ko-fi is also the place for giving us money one time as opposed to regularly. As for what you get out of this, well, besides the obvious your name here and access to our Discord, you will earn our gratitude, and also we will feel indebted to you, which will lead us to keep trying to do our best to keep making things. And also, if you ever encounter us in person, we'll give you a hug if you want one, as long as you're not, like, creepy about it. Is that everything? Yeah, that is everything. Here's the names of all the important people who gave us some of the most money recently. Bree, Hikari no Yume, El Tantavi, Pigeon, Sally, Scimitar, and Tiss. Anyway, that's that. Thanks to all of you, named on screen and vocally, and also those of you not named who've been watching or encouraging us personally for your support. Now, back to the normal part of the video. Spoilers for Suzume from here on, obviously. Okay, so spoilers. Plot of this movie. I'm just gonna steal bits of the Wikipedia summary because I don't want to write a plot summary myself and get waylaid and forget what the script is even about. Suzume Iwato is a 17-year-old high school girl who lives with her maternal aunt in Kyushu. One night, she dreams of searching for her mother, who it's inferred later died in tsunami, as a child in a ruined neighborhood. The next morning, while headed for school, Suzume encounters a young man searching for abandoned areas with doors. He then is cursed to turn into a chair by a kitty cat who desires love, and she runs away from home with him, and he explains that these doors and all these abandoned places are doors to an alternate dimension that occasionally let out supernatural beings called worms that do earthquakes, and they need to do the right rituals to close the door properly. So, their journey across Japan to prevent the earthquakes and also get Sota back out of being a chair thusly begins. First of all, I think that Shinkai did an excellent job conveying the pain of losing one's mother. I say this because we have also lost our mother and grieved her loss. She's not dead, in case you're wondering. She's just a worthless piece of human garbage. So, I guess it's a little perverse to compare our being estranged from our shitty nuclear family as the result of our entire life's events up until we were 20 to Suzume losing her single mom in a natural disaster when she was four, but I can't pretend that the former experience did not lend itself to us empathizing with her in general. Like, we did definitely cry. That's a thing that we did. I also like how cleanly the movie conveys this information within a few minutes. Like, you get the opening sequence of the small Suzume searching for her mother in the ever after, and then she wakes up a 17-year-old, and you hear her address the woman who is her guardian by that woman woman's first name, and it immediately clicks. Oh, orphan. Got it, got it, got it. And yeah. In contrast to the previous two films, where Shinkai took half the damn movie establishing what these characters' lives and their relationships with their friends and relatives were like, this kind of storytelling efficiency, which is present throughout the film in establishing Sota's relationships as well, is impressive. And like I said, I, I like the immediacy with which the plot begins, with Suzume meeting Sota, being asked about the ruins, and then going to check them out herself. I like that there's not a whole album of insert songs in this movie, no fancy opening cinematic, no big deal montage, just a smash cut to the opening title card while Sota and Suzume are trying to close the door in the old bathhouse. It's clean. It's real good. So, then Suzume tries to patch Sota up when he gets injured. Then he gets cursed by this cat to become a chair. And then the movie gets further good. Suzume runs away from home to help chair Sota capture this important cat that's supposed to be keeping the earthquakes from happening. And this greatly aggrieves her aunt, Tamaki, who's just been trying her best her whole life and everything. And I will say, um, I'm going to get to that. So, one thing I have to say specifically. I had not read any details about Suzume's plot or 
interviews from Shinkai before seeing it, and I kind of got the whole deal immediately, with everywhere that an earthquake comes out of being an abandoned place of gathering, closed bathhouse, school, amusement park. This all feels very harrowing to see on screen, as an American, even though it's clearly intended as commentary on Japan's population decline, because, uh, have you heard of dead malls? If they ever do a, an American live-action version of Suzume, it'll be about them visiting abandoned shopping malls, probably. Please do not do that. But like, yeah, like, we live in Portland, Oregon, and compared to having grown up in pre-COVID Philadelphia most of our life, post-COVID Portland feels like a ghost town. Like, it's not actually. There's obviously still people who live here, and I don't mean that derogatorily, because we love Portland and we'd like to keep living here if possible, not the least because we'd get easy access to HRT. But there's a lot of closed and abandoned places in Portland, so many empty areas and businesses that have been boarded up and closed closed to the point that, at times, wandering through downtown Portland almost feels like living in an open-world video game where most of the buildings don't have designed interiors. Places that all clearly closed within the last three or four years with their signage up and everything. Places that are left in stasis to lie disused or else be reclaimed by the homeless until the homeless get chased out by the cops. It's all just really... <sighs> wick. <sighs> It makes us sad to see this place, this whole country really, be just stuck in this kind of disgusting degradation while our government fails to provide for us, let alone adapt to the challenges ahead of us, just leaves all these places where people lived, where people are living now, to stagnate and stand like zombies of a past we can't go back to. There's a scene in Heathers, one of our favorite movies of all time, where the main antagonist, JD, has a whole emotional reflection on how the stability of this franchised commercial convenience store enterprise has kept him feeling like there's continuity in his life, and yeah, it's kind of a feeling. Dallas, Baton Rouge, Vegas, Sherwood, Ohio, has always been a snappy snack shack. Any town, any time. Pop a ham and cheese in the microwave and feast on a turbo dog. Keeps me sane. Really? Like, it's Ueg. Because obviously, as an anti capitalist, we kind of dislike these sorts of places. The shopping centers, the strip malls, the gas stations, where we're against all of this bullshit on principle. These places are all kind of intensely hostile to life in general. But also, these places are a part of the world we live in, and they are stable, relatively. They are kind of the only way we've known the world to be. And it's sad to see that stability be ever so more greatly upset by the pandemic and the everything, with nothing on the horizon to replace it. And if and when we see this kind of stability disappear completely, it'll be sad, even if it is by some miracle replaced by something better. We'll probably miss something about wandering these gross, heavily commercialized, disgustingly homogenized nightmare places that have been cannibalizing our communities this whole time. Yeah, we hate it, but it's where we live, and we're not immune to nostalgia. Nostalgia is just a nicer word for grief. And this same very such weg feeling is very much echoed in Suzume. There's this deep and palpable grief for these places and the people who used to live here felt in this film, and inherent in expressing that grief is Shinkai's expression of the, you know, important stage of grief, i.e. acceptance. Because to close the doors, Suzume and Sota have to not just you know, close them, but also think of all the feelings and experiences of the people who used to live in those places, and then let go. When the amusement park scene happens, the ferris wheel starts moving, and Suzume is drawn in by the image of the ghosts of the people who once rode it. Sota starts yelling for her to stop, to not go in, not the least because she can't see what she's doing and is putting herself in danger, but also because she cannot go back. Those people who used to sit in that ferris wheel, laughing, crying, living in this place, cannot come back. Suzume can't go back. No one can. This past can't be gone back to. 
Okay, so one thing I missed when I saw the film the second time. When Susan May was drawn into the Ever After through the Ferris wheel door, she was seeing herself of the future in there, and that was foreshadowing the end of the film. I'm, I'm keeping this part anyway, because the emotional impact of that scene was still as described, even if this plot foreshadowing bit was something I missed the first time seeing the film. I read a few English language interview articles with Shinkai talking about Suzume right after seeing the film, both because I wanted clarification before I ran my mouth on two things. One, I wanted clarification on what the cat wanted. I'll get to him. Two, I wanted to be sure my interpretation of the doors thing was on point, which it was. Shinkai talks in one of these interviews about how when COVID was happening and Japan was still trying to have the Olympics happen, it felt really irresponsible and bad, and he did not agree with this. He says, and I quote, You are opening this new door and not sure of what's on the other side, without bringing closure or understanding or coming to terms with what's behind you. I want to say a lot of the Japanese population felt the same way. There was this kind of awkward air about us, and it wasn't really time to open new doors without first reflecting on what came before us. And like, yeah, I agree. I just really really agree with this. It is indeed what I took away from the film before I read this interview. Suzume spends this entire movie reflecting on the past and trying to grow beyond that, and ultimately the one door that she opens on purpose is the one that she decides to open intentionally after reflecting on what brought her to this point and deciding what she needs to do, and uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it worked. It really did work. For us, at least. Now, to be clear, Japan and the United States are two different countries, and while there are similarities in how the pandemic left our societies, they're ultimately two different societies, and I don't really know jack shit about Japanese society. I'm just I'm just relating my feelings of my experience, uh, our experience as an American, to the feelings that we took away from Suzume. And even if I understand it's alright. If the people who need this sort of message saw it, or like, took that away, or acted on it when it did, th that'd be nice. But ultimately, I don't think that Suzume will move any politician or other person in power making these decisions in Japan, or any country, enough, or in the right ways to have any impact on policy. But, you know, Shinkai's just a guy making movies, and I'm just one of the various split personalities of a deranged F-list anime YouTuber, so whatever. Such is life. It's at least a nice sentiment. So, the other things, in no particular order. I did cry a bit when Daijin, the cat, got sucked back up into the Keystone. He started to like at the start of the film for, you know, the reasons why he is, but ultimately when you consider that, like, he's been trapped that way, the same way as Sota's been trapped as a chair for years, centuries, for all we goddamn know, once that clicks, it's really hard to not empathize with him. And yeah, he might be a god now, I guess, but who knows if he was a person before, or what even, and just, I think, I think if you spend god knows how long as a sacred relic keeping Japan from being destroyed by earthquakes, you at least, at least, at least maybe, maybe deserve, if nothing else, a little pet. That was your little pet. In one of the other interviews Shinkai did, he talked about how Sota becoming a chair, and also a keystone sealing away the earthquakes, is intended as a metaphor for the experience of pandemic lockdown. It's not a directly equivalent analogy, but like, it does make sense. Sota is being forced into a position of being confined to keep this dangerous and virtually uncontrollable force of nature under control, for the greater good and long-term preservation of society. And when you consider that Daijin was in the same position for gosh knows how the hell long, makes it a lot easier to empathize with him. He wasn't being malicious, exactly, not willfully anyway. He knew that vacating his position was putting everyone else at risk, but he did it anyway because he just kind of snapped, like, fuck this, I want to go outside. That does make a lot of sense. And it sticks out, also, when Suzume screams at Daijin because that's, you know, it's a whole scene. I feel like I want to say something about this, but I can't really land on anything to say about it, but yeah. I think the whole thing with Suzume needing to sacrifice Sota midway through the movie is 
really well done. It's extremely funny to me that Shin Kai apparently thought to stress this point of the movie is how important it is for her to make this difficult choice because of how people criticized Weathering With You for not really being meaningfully critical of the consequence of Horika unsacrificing Hina, and also that Hina never really gets a choice in being unsacrificed, far as I remember, so yeah, it's a little unintentionally sexist, but whatever. I'd have to watch the film again, and I don't feel like doing that right now. Suzume's aunt, Tamaki. I do like her. She's a pretty level-headed guardian, as guardians go. I like that when she finds Suzume and Sarazawa in the car, and sees that going to this door is important to Suzume, she's not immediately, like, fuck your feelings, we're going home. She's curious about the child under her care. She's concerned in a way that she's willing to not only go all the way to Tokyo, but also to follow Suzume the rest of the way to see what's up, because she clearly understands, logically, that even if she doesn't know what it is that's compelled Suzume to go this distance, it must be something that she needs to sort the fuck out in order to move on with her life, and that's kinda good. Although, I should note that even while she sees the pragmatic value in not fighting Suzume on this, she's also pretty reluctant to. She has a line where she's like to Serizawa while Suzume is asleep. Let's turn the fuck around and go back, she'll give up. So, you know, Tamaki is at least more open-minded than our mom was. Speaking of that, there's this one scene in the film where Tamaki loses her shit at Suzume, goes on screaming about how she hates Suzume and wants her life back, and then she runs off to Sarazawa being like, I think I'm losing it, and it's a whole thing. On her first viewing, this scene felt a little out of nowhere. It was a whole sudden shock to have this intense scene happen, and then also it's pivot back into the magical realism aspects of the film with Black Cat's appearance, which confused us a bit, because I don't think that was really explained at all. But, watching the film a second time, and seeing the arc of Tamaki's frustration reaching its peak with the benefit of hindsight, it made more sense that she'd come to a rope's end and flip out like this. She's been chasing her niece all across Japan, she's ridden for several hours in a busted convertible in the rain, she doesn't even have a proper explanation, her co-worker has raised to her that this might be an, an, a kidnapping scheme. I get it, I get it. It's it's a scene that I get. I still do not understand the role of the large black cat, though. Our friend agreed that that part didn't make a whole lot of sense, so that impression didn't change. I think the reason why it felt out of nowhere to us the first time is because it was entirely too familiar to our real-life experience. In the middle of Tamaki's rant, Suzume responds by saying, But you said you're my daughter, referring to when Tamaki first took her in and said that, and Tamaki snaps back, I never said that. Our mother also did this exact kind of thing, vehemently denying that she said and did things that we definitely remembered her saying and doing. There's a word for this, it's it's called gaslighting. Living with someone who denies you this much, who makes you question your memory and your sanity and your general perception of the world this much by forcing their own grief onto you like this is just really simply awful. Throughout our childhood, we heard our mom say similar shit to us numerous times, that we were a horrible, incorrigible child, that she hated us for ruining her family, that she wished she'd aborted us, all those sorts of things. The tone of Tamaki's unadulterated rage in this dialogue was all too familiar to those memories, so yeah, on both viewings, we were very uncomfortable. Even knowing it was coming the second time around, it kind of caused us to actively recoil in our seat to the point that our friend who we were seeing it with noticed our reaction and held out a stuffed animal she brought with her for us to pet. So, um, yeah, that specific scene may or may not have triggered the PTSD that we may or may not have. Tamaki does apologize for this later, and she also debatably gets a bit of a pass for this since she's not suited. Suzume's mother, and thus cannot reasonably wish that she had aborted Suzume, but can instead wish that she'd not done the unambiguously good deed of keeping Suzume out of the Japanese child welfare system, which I can't imagine is a good experience for a child. I don't imagine any country's 
child welfare system under capitalism to be a good experience for a child, but, you know. Well, we're also kind of entirely opposed to the traditional family structure and the basic premise of parents in general, because giving only one or two people total power over a vulnerable young human life is not an ethical tradition to have in any case, but, like... That's something for some other video. In an interview with Deadline, Shinkai talks about this scene, specifically quoting the give me back my life part, and he says that on some level, all parents feel that way to their kids, and that while he acknowledges it isn't by any means acceptable to ever say that kind of stuff to a child, it is, you know, a feeling that is there that he poured into it, and that he wanted to be there for the parents in the audience who ever felt that way and regretted it. This is how we found out that Makoto Shinkai apparently is not single and does in fact have a child. He also says in this other interview with The Verge that he wanted the film to provide for an opportunity for people of different generations to emotionally connect with each other. He wanted this to be a movie that you could watch with your mom, in other words. So in that context, I really understand why this scene is here. It's serving the purpose of setting up that emotional bridge, that door between Suzume and Tamaki, these characters of two different generations who ultimately come to understand one another, with the hope that audiences in a similar emotional position might come away from the film having felt some sense of healing by way of you know, getting that. And also Shinkai talks about how the idealized nuclear family structure is not a thing that's tenable or possible for a lot of families in Japanese society. It's not very tenable for a lot of people in American society either. So, I recognize the intent of this scene. I think it's commendable, even. If there is a parent and child out there who saw Suzume together on whom this had the intended impact, I think that that's wonderful. I sincerely hope that they exist. Even still, we were a child who regularly had this sort of thing said to our face by our real-life mother, and tried in good faith many times over the years to repair our increasingly fraught relationship with her, and failed. I am deeply, regrettably cynical about familial relationships because of our traumatic experience with our own family. Our mother is not the sort of person who would come to meaningfully empathize with us through seeing this film. And we really fucking hate her, so yeah, this scene is difficult to watch. It's difficult for us personally to feel any sympathy for Tamaki when she's saying that kind of stuff to Suzume, and once it was over, I could only really kind of feel glad that it was over. But it's not like it's the film's fault that our parents were bad. I don't think our reaction was intended. It just happened. It just happens sometimes that different people, other than who the thing was written for, react to things differently. That doesn't make the scene bad or any less valuable to include. And I do think that Tamaki's relationship with Suzume is portrayed pretty well and with a surprising degree of nuance. It's good. Tamaki is a good character and she means well. And I do like what Shinkai said in that Verge interview about wanting to portray other family structures. However, I think that their relationship would work better if she was gay, because honestly, that entire get out of my life speech would hit a lot more and probably work a lot better in the context of being directed at a gay teenager rather than an assumed heterosexual one. But hey, we thought we were heterosexual for most of our life, so who's to say much of anything? Was there anything else I forgot to talk about? Um, we cried at the end of the film, both times we saw it. And also, while this film couldn't have improved our relationship with our mother, it did serve as a very good bonding experience with our friend. I'm really glad we took her to see it. She really likes the scenes where Suzume sits and steps on Sota as a chair, that that was clever, that they took the opportunity to get away with that with him as a chair. And she also agreed that the chair in general was really well portrayed visually. She also cried at the end. The heterosexual chair film made a lesbian cry. Two lesbians cry. I'm not going to say anything more than that. Thank you to everyone who watched this entire video. I have an excuse to do a bad job editing it now because there's not that much footage of Suzume available and it's all gonna get me copyright striked anyway. To summarize, Suzume good. Suzume. Watch Suzume. I've been Audrey of the joystick system and I did not hate Suzume. Thank you. Good night.